and welcome to New Heaven, New Earth. Last year, we did a program with Itzhak Bentoff, a Boston-based researcher into the relationship between consciousness and the cosmos, and, uh, and, and based upon a book which he wrote called Stalking the Wild Pendulum. This book has since become somewhat of a bestseller among people who are interested in the relationship between consciousness and the cosmos, and we wanted to, once again, get an opportunity this morning to speak with Mr. Bentoff. Ben Bentoff is a wonderful, loving, kind man, a brave, courteous, true, <laughs> all the other kind things you can say. The interesting thing about him is that he has, over the years, conducted research into consciousness. The subtitle of his book is The Mechanics of Consciousness, and what we want to try to talk about today is one aspect of it, and that is the evolution of consciousness. Ben, we, there's probably no theory that has had more impact on Western thinking than the theory of evolution that Darwin came up with in the mid-19th century. And ever since then, all of our thought has been along the ideas that somehow we have evolved as human beings to being who we are today. The, place, the question I want to ask you is, where do you see us now in that evolutionary development? We can say that if we take uh, Darwin's theories as being correct, then we know that uh, we have evolved from the apes towards uh, humans, and now we have finally come to a point where we are uh, humanoid in shape, we have vertical spines, we are reasonably intelligent, we can push buttons on TV, <laughs> uh, drive cars, etc., etc., and what I'd like to do, I'd like to uh, draw maybe a, a, a little diagram, but don't worry, it's not very scientific. Let me draw a, what is called a bell curve, which looks somehow like this. It's being used in, in describing random events, and the way this works is the following, that if we assume now, let's, let's take a, a following situation. Take a little town that has maybe a thousand people in it. And we have this great desire to find out what the average height of people in this town is. And therefore, we go out with a yardstick and start measuring these people. Well, we find that a very small, very few number of people will be, say, three feet tall. And a very, very few of them will be maybe seven or eight feet tall. The bulk of the population will be right somewhere here. That is the average or mean height of these people would be about five feet and six or eight inches, something like this. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> so what we find here is that uh, this bell curve gives us a, a good picture of where most of the population is. That is what typifies uh, uh, population. We can use this diagram also to describe evolution. The bulk of the population today is this intelligent more or less intelligent biped, all right? And uh, uh, with a vertical spine, and who pushes the buttons on TV and drives a car, etc., etc. Now, there is some back throw. That is, there are some people here in this area, very few people who are still gorilla-like. That is, they are hairy. <laughs> they beat their chest when they see their neighbors and a few other things. And then we have other people who are here in this corner, very few of them, who are very highly developed, because we say that evolution is now pushing mankind in this direction, away from the gorilla types, towards the very highly evolved people. At this point, we're here. What's going to happen maybe a million years from now, half a million years from now? This curve is going to shift. It's going to shift like this. That is, the bulk of the population will be very, very highly evolved. We have gone away altogether from the gorilla types, no more gorillas. And what we have here now is the average man is now the retarded person uh -huh. in evolutionary terms. The bulk of the population is extremely, very, very highly evolved. And the cutting edge of evolution here these are very, very highly evolved people. We can't even imagine what kind, what kind of person that will be. He may not have a physical body at all. What's the habitat, so to speak, of this group here? Well, you just go out and you find them. They're, they're all over the place. The habitat of this group here, what do you think? What do you think you find these people here? Huh? Um, 
Uh, I, I suspect that you would find them in universities. You'd find the, you know, the people who are very bright, people who are uh, in the leading edge of professions. That kind of thing. I mean, it's an intellectual thing, isn't it? Well, I suggest that you find them in mental hospitals, in nut houses. And well, the reason for that is that these people, they live in a different reality, in a reality which, which is very changed, and few of them are adapted to live in this reality. So naturally, they can't function very well. So the only safe place, only good place for them would be the mental hospital, unless they can integrate their, their, their different view of reality with their daily lives. Now, if they can integrate it, then we have people like, like Newton, like Darwin, like, like, uh, like uh, you mean, so Faraday. Great. These are the so-called geniuses. The, the thing that I'm not certain that we have talked about is, what is it that is evolving? Let's put it this way. The nervous system is the thing that is evolving and the nervous system is supported by a skeleton of bones and muscles and tissue, etc., etc. Now, uh, the nervous system is that thing that gives us the picture of our realities. That is, our realities, that reality which you see all, all around you, the flowers and the chairs and the microphones and the uh, teacup, is given to us by our senses. Yeah. We don't see light which is beyond UV and beyond infrared. Uh, we hear only a limited uh, scale of vibrations, like, for instance, we hear anywhere from 52 to 20,000 maximum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In other words, all our senses are limited. So, well, these limited senses, we naturally are seeing through a very narrow kind of tube mm -hmm. or very narrow slit in the total reality there is. Mm -hmm. Now, as you're evolving, what happens is that that slit opens up, opens up more and more and more. So you see more and more of that reality, and we assume that we see different realities. They're not very different realities, but rather an, a very extended, broad view of one very large reality. The Bible mentions maybe four to six colors maximum. Yeah. That is what people saw just bare maybe 4,000 years ago. Uh, nowadays, we see hundreds and thousands of colors. That is, our visual system has evolved. Mm -hmm. Our fellow mammals, like cows and horses, see only black and white. Uh -huh. So this is one example of the evolution of the nervous system. The senses are an extension of our nervous system. Mm -hmm. Our eyes, our ears, etc., are an extension of our brain, uh -huh. so to I speak. See. Okay, so now, before you were talking about the people who were the mutants either yeah. being in the uh, mental hospitals or being yeah. geniuses. Yeah. These are people who have expanded perception, and hence they can see yeah. a reality which ordinary people at this stage of evolution are not able to see. Correct. What is the nature of that reality which they're able to see? Well, that is uh, <laughs> classified as a non-physical reality sometimes. We can take an example, say, uh, well, let's take a simple example. The family sitting at dinner table and uh, say there's a kid, maybe 15 years old, 16 years old, and he looks up and suddenly he says to his mother, hey, Ma, look at, there's, there's uh, our dead grandmother is standing in the corner. <laughs> mother looks around and says, no, oh, uh, there's no grandmother there. And she says, well, kiddo, you, there's something wrong with you. You need help. You're crazy. So you're crazy. So uh -huh. she takes him off to the friendly neighborhood psychiatrist and same thing happens. A psychiatrist will ask him, well, kiddo, what do you see? Well, you'll see, well, don't you see, doctor, over there in the corner, don't you see this person standing there? Well, the psychiatrist turns around, no, there's no such thing. Well, and then the mm, psychiatrist says, oh, young fella, you're in trouble, and then he writes out a little prescription for a little Thorazine or electroshock or whatever, and pretty soon, in a matter of two weeks, Kid is back in shape, very normal. No longer sees the No longer <laughs> sees anything. Yeah. <laughs> so the process has been reversed. This is called a psychotic episode uh, or mm -hmm. acute schizophrenic break or whatever it is. And what you would say is that there's a good chance that that kid is seen. Very the good chance the that the kid has a spontaneous opening of his senses. Uh -huh. So that the evolution has been rushed up or right. hurried up? Quickly. Yeah. Now... This actually happens. There are techniques to do this. But 
uh, the Eastern uh, uh, people, the, the yogis, have developed systems to, to do this, to push the nervous system rapidly. But it happens very often spontaneously without uh, someone trying to do anything about mm -hmm. it. And it just happens. And then, naturally, in the olden days, these kinds of things used to be called miracles. <laughs> And, and uh, nowadays, uh, there's no more miracles. Well, let's, let's take this. Uh, and let's yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Because uh, in, uh, you, you think of, uh, I mean, what you call the spontaneous opening of uh, expanded awareness. Correct. Right? I mean, that, that's sort of a lot of words yeah. to say something. But in an earlier time, it was called a miraculous occurrence. Yeah. Uh, elevated well, consciousness. Uh, right. You know, a time of great revelation uh, of sure. uh, God speaking to you. Now, uh, take uh, like this fellow, um, St. Paul, yeah? He's <laughs> going or walking or riding to, to Damascus in the olden days. And suddenly this big ball of white light descends and uh, Jesus standing in a ball of light and he says, hey, why don't you lay off of my people and stop doing whatever you're doing and all that. And he's very impressed and he's even blinded and he falls down and, and uh, one thing and another. But anyway, he makes it somehow to Damascus and uh, there he starts a big campaign and, and he talks about his experience and the big public relations thing and, and he got the thing going. He got the church built and, and uh, the Judeo-Christian ethic came out of this and bingo and all the things that, you know, <laughs> that go with this. So we've yeah. got something. Yeah. Now, suppose the same thing would happen and this fellow, so is St. Paul, say, is driving down on Route 128. Yeah? Driving down. <laughs> Route 128 doesn't go to Damascus. Well, it doesn't go to Damascus. It goes to, <laughs> to Dedham. <laughs> so, okay. So, so then uh, this fellow is driving, and suddenly this big ball of light descends in front of his windshield, and there's Jesus standing in front of, front of him, and he gets very, very impressed, and his driving naturally gets kind of wobbly. And so, sure enough, there's a cop behind him, and he says, ooh, ooh, you know, and gets him off to the side of the road. And uh, he says, uh, sir, may I have your license and, and registration and all that? And, and this fellow is so impressed and he keeps babbling something about Jesus and all that. And the cop says, well, uh, you must be driving under the influence, right? So he arrests him and takes him to the station. Uh -huh. Then what happens is that uh, he comes to the station and then they tell him, well, uh, uh, he still is under the influence, you see. So they call an ambulance and send him off to the mental hospital. So now the, 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 the reception desk, they interview him, a very short interview, and uh, uh, the guy puts down in the logbook that the fellow came in with an acute psychotic or, or schizophrenic episode with religious overtones. That's it. Uh -huh. And this is what we did to the miracle. <laughs> so we took the miracle and we ground it down really to gray powder. So no more miracles. Okay. Everybody's so. complaining that during the Bible times, on every page of the Bible, you have a miracle or two, and now there's no miracles. This is what we're doing to the miracles. We're just flattening the Bible. What is it that is evolving? Now, you talked about the nervous system evolving, right? But yeah. is there something else that is evolving that is able to be sensitive to this higher level of reality? We have this notion of the soul. You know? Most people... Uh, well, I'm talking about the soul, it's a kind of non-physical thing, highly theoretical. And so when you go to church, you take this soul out of the closet and polish it up a little bit, and then you go to church and you, you are one <laughs> with your soul. Then you come back and put it back in the closet till next week. So uh, that's about the idea of a normal person, the soul. But actually, that's not the case. I mean, we don't have souls, but it's just the other way around. The soul has us. So, that is, that thing that evolves, the permanent, eternal thing, is the soul, and the body is a kind of disposable thing. Uh -huh. That is, you know, you, you use a body uh, like a car for 80,000 miles, 100,000 miles, and you chunk it, and that's it, you get another one. So, it's the, the driver is the soul who, who uses the body for a while, and then he runs it into the ground, and he gets another one sooner or later. And, and so, it's the soul which is experiencing evolution, and not our personality, not our physical yeah. uh, existences. That is, the soul is the repository of information that we gather during life. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, maybe we should draw another diagram.
-hmm. Physical bodies are here, and another physical body, and another physical body, and this is Joe, and this is Jim, and this is Sarah, etc. Uh -huh. Now, clearly, on the phys this is the physical level, yeah? Now, on this physical level, we are separate. You sit there, and I sit here, and we're all separate. Now, let's draw another level. This level is, is slightly higher, and let's call this the level of the soul, yeah? Well, there will be some mingling here. Let's, let's draw this person as extending to practically infinity this way. Now, look what happens. At the physical level, we are separate. We are separate and there's this much distance between mm -hmm. us. Let's say that on the soul level, this person extends this much, and the other person gets slightly mixed in with him. That is, the souls are, in a way, in touch with each other. Okay, they overlap, these two lines. Now, let's go now to a higher level, and let's call this, uh, say, the level of the higher self, which is kind of a boss of that soul. Mm -hmm. uh, there, what we find is that this fellow's higher self extends this much, and the other fellow extends this much. Mm -hmm. There is more overlap between them. Right. On the very highest level, which is the high spiritual level, we are basically overlapping completely. Everybody is overlapping everybody else. In other words, everything and everyone is everywhere. In other words, we have become omnipresent. This is a state of highly spiritual perfected beings, or gods you may call them. Mm -hmm. Okay? Okay, and so that we exist on all of those simultaneously. On all of those simultaneously, so then but the, we're not in, aware of that. In, in, in your view, then, if we, when we see each other as separate entities, that's only seen on one plane of reality. Correct. And so whether we like it or not, we're all evolving towards godhood. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it takes eons, so don't hold your breath. Is that the purpose of evolution? Naturally. Because at that point, you start understanding how the system works. And one of the good things about the system is that the system wants to teach you about itself. Mm -hmm. what does it's it a want good to teach system. Yeah? Yeah. What does it want to teach you? Well, if you are... If you are omnipresent and you're all-knowing, that is the state which the system wants you to be in. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the system is an intelligence or information gathering system. Mm -hmm. so and it's all of also freely distributing that information. In your view, yeah. we all started off somewhere a long time ago in which there was sort of undifferentiated matter which slowly millions and millions and millions of eons evolved until a very complex organism that we now call a human being. Mm -hmm. And it has a nervous system which we at this particular point in time understand as being sensitive to certain levels of reality through our eyes, our ears, our nose, other sensory perception. And that's sort of what we call material ordinary reality that enables us to drive cars and do our work every day. Mm -hmm. However, there is an evolutionary movement that will continue to push us beyond where we are today. Mm -hmm. And the thing which is going to be pushed is our soul, and that at some point we will have these experiences of elevated consciousness in which higher realities are not only seen but lived and ultimately we come into perfection whether we like it or not yeah, yeah. <laughs> can we speed that up by doing it yeah well you use the, the meditative techniques which push the nervous system a lot faster than the normal evolutionary rate mm -hmm. Those techniques are available, but uh, you don't need to do uh, anything. It's going to happen anyway. It's going to happen. Mm -hmm. What a view. It's a, <laughs> a very big, bright view. His full name was pronounced Itzhak Bentov, 
but to most people he was known simply as Ben. Ben would usually start his talks by saying, now we will talk about all there is, from atom to cosmos, from humanhood to godhood, no less. And he would talk about the nature of reality and our place in it, and his own model of the universe, and his personal experiences in expanded states of consciousness. And finally, at the end, the ultimate question, who runs the show? Ben had a tremendous sense of humor and a capacity to explain very complex ideas in a very simple and uh, understandable way. And he illustrated his two books with his own cartoon-like drawings. Niels Bohr has said, some things are so serious that one can only laugh about them. Ben called himself a nuts and bolts man, a plumber. He was trained as a mechanical engineer and uh, somewhere along the way, he started meditating and his consciousness opened up so that reality began to be perceived by him in two ways, two kinds of knowledge, the linear, scientific, objective knowledge and the direct, intuitive, inner knowledge of a mystic. And the combination of these two gave him a unique and a very unusual perspective on the nature of reality. First of all, he saw reality as a hologram. It's a totality in which every part is related to every other part and they're all interdependent. And this hologram he perceived as vibratory in nature. In other words, as he said, it's an off and on reality, and we are only part time here. It's an oscillating field, and it may appear to us as a continuous reality, whereas in fact, it's like a film composed of, se of separate frames. He looked at reality as a whole, as consciousness itself consciousness in the state of evolution, of unfolding itself to itself, to know itself. And there is nothing outside it. So that the physical reality, the manifest world, is only another expression of that reality, which is consciousness or existence itself, aware of itself. And um, matter is then another expression of consciousness at different levels of evolution. So that one can look at reality as being composed of an innumerable number of levels of reality. Each level have it, having its corresponding level of consciousness. And reality is perceived by those who are experiencing it only on the level of their own evolution of the nervous system. The mechanism in the physical body that perceives reality is the nervous system itself. And so, as a biomedical engineer, this is what Ben specialized in, he became interested in studying the effects of uh, changes in consciousness on physiology. And I must say that Ben, whenever he talked about these matters, never claimed this to be any sort of ultimate teaching. He, he spoke about this as a working model. And um, he would say, I speak from my present level of ignorance, because ignorance grows exponentially. The more questions you ask and the more answers you get, the more questions there are to ask. So it's an unending process of unfoldment of consciousness. And uh, Ben saw reality, or I should say reality unfolded itself to him in the form of structure because he dealt with mechanisms. To someone else 
with another background, reality would reveal itself in terms of, let's say, poetic metaphor uh, or um, vibrations of different sounds to a musician so that we all are like snowflakes, all similar, yet all different. And uh, the subtitles of his two books actually indicate that reality appeared to him in terms of structure because the subtitles are on the mechanics of consciousness and on the mechanics of creation. So Ben has designed instruments to study these physiological changes uh, that occur in the body when a certain energy rises through the spine. In the East, it's called Kundalini, uh, or coiled serpent. It rises up the spine and awakens certain energies in the body, which allow perception to uh, become broader, and uh, the brain functions then on a different level. He called it his model of Kundalini. Ben looked at reality as being driven by the force of evolution to infinity as consciousness unfolds itself. So in this graph, this arrow would represent the energy of evolution. And the bell curve, so-called, is a method to uh, show graphically statistical data. And if the peak of this curve represents the average level of consciousness of humanity now, and the lower end of it shows the lowest level of consciousness, let's say the mafia types, as he used to put it, then the cutting edge here, the highest edge, would be individuals such as Einstein or Leonardo da Vinci. Now, as evolution pushes this ahead, some years from now, this bell curve will assume this position. So what will happen? that the average consciousness will be where the advanced consciousness is today, the low level will be where the average is today, and the high consciousness of, that, of humanity at that time will be something that we can hardly imagine. Because as he used to say, the potential of the human nervous system is enormous, and we, and we really don't know where it's taking us from humanhood to godhood. And this chart shows an experiment that he did with a subject sitting on a chair that had a device attached to it called ballistograph. And the ballistograph is something that picks up micro vibrations of the body. So the large curve that you see reflects the motion up and down of the subject as the breathing occurs. And then the small, uh, uh, wiggly lines superimposed on that indicate the heartbeat. The lower part of the chart shows the same individual in a state of deep meditation, which also means deep relaxation. And look what happened. The breathing is practically gone. It's a straight line. And what was a disrupted pattern of the heartbeat has turned into a regular sine wave. And looking at this as an engineer, Ben said, this is a, an effect of harmonization of all the frequencies within the body, and the body is now resonating like a tuned instrument. And he came up with what he called the uh, uh, Kundalini syndrome uh, model. In other words, when this energy in the spine rises, uh, the harmony occurs where the vibration turns into the sine wave at seven cycles per second, or seven hertz, as compared to the regular disrupted pattern. And as an engineer, he looked at the body in terms of vibrating systems, or oscillators. And in this case, there are five. The heart aorta system, the brain itself, a cavity in the brain, which is filled with fluid, a ventricle, and then the brain itself, the sensory cortex, and then all this results in an electromagnetic field around the head. 
A system which comes into harmony within itself becomes more powerful than others, and it will entrain, this is another term he used, it will entrain or pull after itself a system that is out of harmony. So once this oscillator or resonating system comes into harmony, it will trigger the rest one after the other. It's a domino effect. So as the heart pumps blood through the aorta, and he called the aorta the biggest plumbing in the body. So it's a tremendous impact on the body and it shakes the body so that it vibrates. It hits the bifurcation into the legs and a certain plane wave is reflected up. The next pulse comes down and the, the plane wave and the pulse clash and it creates a disruption in the body. When the harmonious seven hertz vibration is set up, it seems that the heart and the lungs begin to talk to each other and they begin to work in harmony so that a pulse comes down and waits for the reflection to come up and they both go up together and then the next pulse comes down and there is no clash occurring anymore and the body goes into resonance triggering the next oscillator which is the brain and looking at the head again from the point of view of engineering it's a rigid box resting on a resilient column which is the, the spine what happens is as the body goes up and down the skull is vibrated and the uh, brain, which is a gel-like substance, is floating in a fluid, the cerebrospinal fluid, so that each time the body goes up, it's, it's hitting the skull and then goes down and so up and down it goes and it creates a plane wave within the brain. The brain has a characteristic called piezoelectric which means that when it's stimulated mechanically, it develops an electromagnetic field around it, which is this field right here eventually. So this is the second oscillator which triggers the third. This is the fluid-filled uh, cavity in the brain called ventricle. And due to this regular vibration of seven cycles, or seven hertz per second, a standing wave is created is established in the ventricle, which uh, again creates a very harmonious uh, frequency. And this in turn triggers the uh, uh, sensory cortex. This is a cross-section of the brain, and this is a cross-section of the third ventricle filled with fluid. On top of the third ventricle is a drum-like surface with a bundle of nerve fiber crossing it, which connects the right and left brain hemispheres. And this is very important because as the fluid vibrates harmoniously, it activates this um, fiber, nerve fiber, and it harmonizes the two brain hemispheres. And we know that consciousness opens up when uh, the um, uh, synchronization of the functioning of the two hemispheres occurs. And then a certain current is established in, in the sensory cortex in the lobe of the brain. And as I said before, all this results in an electromagnetic field around the head so that the head actually becomes an antenna capable of sending out and receiving information which it could not do otherwise. And in that state, uh, higher perceptions become possible. And this was Ben's theory that through the mechanism of Kundalini uh, and the a resonant state of the body, higher perceptions become available. Uh, this is an illustration of the sympathetic resonance, how those oscillators trigger each other. If you pluck the strings of this violin, then the strings on this one will resonate without being touched. And this is how uh, the uh, oscillators relate to each other through resonance. And so, as we walk on this planet Earth, with, which is charged negatively, by the way, we are bathed in a sea of vibrations of all kinds of electromagnetic fields and uh, all kinds of frequencies, radio and others. And the ionosphere is charged positively, and the potential between the two is constantly fluctuating so that we are subjected to all sorts of influences all the time. But in that state of resonance at 7 hertz, we plug into 
the vibration of the Earth itself, which is stable, and it happens to be the same seven cycles per second, so that this biosphere around the Earth resonates at the same frequency and we get locked in to the frequency of the planet itself. And this is why the meditative state is such a relaxing state that some people find it difficult to come out of. Now, having become part of the vibration of the Earth, we then in turn plug into the vibration of the entire solar system. Because our Earth here is shown surrounded by all kinds of vibrations as well. There is the magnetopause, magnetosphere, plasma sheet, you name it, trapped radiation. There, is, uh, there are acoustical waves, the solar wind coming from the sun, which is also affecting the Earth. So that having, having tuned into the frequency of the Earth, we in turn tune into the frequency of the entire solar system and the sun, and so on into the cosmos. This is the cosmic connection. As Ben measured these fields around the body, he found that at that frequency of 7 hertz, the field around the body expands the energy that can be measured, and it extends to about 20 inches and tapers off. In a situation where there were hundreds of people meditating at the same time, Ben conducted an experiment because many of these individuals reported hearing inner sounds inside their heads. So when he measured the frequencies of the sounds that they heard, he found that there was one major sound and then other peaks where many people heard certain frequencies. And as he looked at this, and of course this is in kilohertz, as he looked at this, he realized that these other peaks are really the harmonics of the initial sound. In other words, everybody is really hearing one sound, but then it breaks up into harmonics, and some people hear entire chords. It really varies depending on one's evolution. This is how the third ventricle actually looks in the brain, and this is the cross-section of it that we spoke about. And on the brain, there is a narrow band called the sensory cortex. When stimulated mechanically with a needle, for example, during operations, it creates sensations in different parts of the body, and the sensations are laid out in this pattern, and this is called the homunculus, or the little man. And uh, as you notice, the toes are inside the, the fold of the brain, and then the hip, the hand, and so on. The internal organs are here. So usually the signal goes to the sensory cortex and, and uh, back to the motor system, telling the body what to do, how to react to the stimulus. But what happens in the Kundalini process, that this circuit becomes activated. And one begins to experience certain parts of the body uh, spontaneously without them being actually stimulated physically. So one doesn't really know, is it happening in the brain or is it happening on the physical level? So eventually, as this current, and he really called it not a current, but an alignment of neurons due to the stimulation of the fiber here, the nerve fiber across the... Um, brain, this alignment eventually becomes a permanent situation so that one's range of perceptions is tremendously expanded. And another thing that happens is that this current or alignment goes also through the pleasure centers so that actually a person in this state uh, is uh, in a state of bliss, and a yogi sitting in a cave in Himalayas is actually having a lot of fun. So nobody's forcing them to, to sit for days on end cross-legged. And as Ben said, you can speed up the process of evolution, but we're all on this conveyor belt, and nature is carrying us along, and uh, we will get there anyway, from humanhood to godhood, whether we like it or not. So um, eventually, as this current continues, starts at the toe and goes up around the body, and it opens up 
certain energy centers in the body known as chakras. And eventually the current begins to go around and round and its function is to clear the body of stress so that it can actually perceive higher realities. And if there is a blockage anywhere, it will keep pushing through that until it's cleared so that it can actually go further. And some people can experience great discomfort because of that and uh, not understanding what the mechanism is. And Ben wanted actually to inform the medical community, particularly the psychiatric community, about the phenomenon so that certain symptoms would not be misdiagnosed sometimes as they are as um, schizophrenia or, or uh, actually some physical illness, which it is not. Certainly this mechanism and this phenomenon was known in antiquity and this pharaoh is saying my status symbol is this, that my kundalini has risen to the center in the forehead. And in this painting uh, it's being said again, it's all coded in these graphic um, uh, patterns. This is saying, my kundalini has reached this level and has gone even beyond the pharaohs. So this knowledge really was quite universal. Now we will continue and we will look at the way Ben looked at reality. Because what is it that gives us our reality? And it was described in his book, Stalking the Wild Pendulum on the Mechanics of Consciousness. And I will talk later why he used the pendulum as the symbol of what he was talking about. We are dealing with two realities. One is this physical, solid reality that we get blue and black marks from, as he said, when we bump into it. But the information about it is given us by our senses. So that is our subjective reality. And so the two really are giving us the totality of our environment. So what is the objective physical reality? And let us look at the atom. If we magnify the atom and zero in on the electron, and now we think now we will get the answer to what physical matter is. But if we analyze the electron, all we find is an oscillating electromagnetic field. There's no physical matter as such. So we think, well, maybe the nucleus will give us the answer. And we zero in on the nucleus, and we find that it, too, is only an electromagnetic oscillating field in the void. Because between the nucleus and the electron and outside of them, there is nothing but void, the same void that fills in the interstellar space. And the ratio of the distance between the nucleus and the electron would be analogous to a, to a head of a pin in the middle of this room and something rotating around it 30 feet away. And the rest is void. So what is physical matter? Ben drew an analogy between the electron and the pendulum by looking at the cross-section, as it were, of the atom and comparing it to reciprocal motion. In other words, we see the electron now on this side, now on the other side of the nucleus, which would be the pendulum motion. So what happens in the pendulum? It stops, it moves, stops, and moves again. In other words, it's action and rest, action and rest. If you took an actual pendulum, and would swing it and attach a pen to, the, to it. And you would draw a piece of paper under it, like this. It would describe a sine wave. Here the pendulum moved and stopped, moved and stopped. And reality really are the spaces between the points of rest. We perceive reality when there is motion. And reality is really nothing but oscillating fields in the void. And the reason I can touch this screen and I don't go through the floor is because my atoms or the electrons of my atoms are actually repelling the electrons of the floor. But if I would speed up my vibration, then I could very well go through the floor. So that it's the interaction between uh, the uh, atoms in this reality that gives us the illusion of solid matter. 
So how do we get information about this solid physical reality? It is through our senses, through the subjective reality. So let's look at that. How does the neuron work? If this is a neuron, and this is the baseline when the neuron is at rest, when it's stimulated by something, and it doesn't care whether it's a loud noise or a bright light, it simply says, ouch, I'm being disturbed. So the more such spikes you have on the baseline, the more intense the stimulus. But somehow through a miracle of our physiology, our brain can construct our reality out of these spikes that simply indicate a stimulation of the nervous system. And we see beautiful flowers and animals and the sky and so forth. And as we know, our senses are very inadequate. They're very limited and imperfect. Even bees, for example, can perceive ultraviolet light. And dogs can hear the ultrasonic. So that we see reality through our senses only through a very narrow uh, slot and the rest is really unknown to us. And so we're looking at the physical objective reality, which is oscillating, as we saw, through another system, our subjective uh, reality, through our nervous system, which also perceives it through action, rest and action and rest and action and rest. So one oscillating system is looking at another oscillating system, and the picture is very blurred indeed. We can extend our reality through instruments, uh, telescopes and microscopes, but in the final analysis, it is only our senses that give us the knowledge. So our subjective reality, then, is the sum of impressions conveyed by our senses coded in periods of action and rest, which are oscillating electrical states of the nervous system. And we're constantly comparing one thing to another, Otherwise, we would not perceive reality. For example, if the uh, muscle of the eye is anesthetized, then we do not see anything because the eye needs to scan all the time in order to see something. So both realities become real due to a change occurring between two states of rest. When there is change, there is motion, and whereas the, when there is no change and a total state of rest, then reality, as far as we are concerned, disappears because we cannot perceive it. So let's look at the overall picture. Here is the atom, and it can be um, represented as a sine wave of motion and rest, motion and rest, which is analogous to the motion of the pendulum. Now, let us take a hypothetical situation where we are taking a wavelength, let's say a red photon, which has a very large amplitude. The distances between the points of rest are very far apart. And then we take the same, uh, let's say one inch, in other words, the same unit of frequencies, and we speed them up so that within the same length we have many more ups and downs, and uh, let's say it's a violet photon, and then the points of rest get a little closer together, but we get more of them within that span. Then we speed it up even more, uh, let's say the gamma rays or x-rays, and we see that we get even more spikes and, uh, or waves, and they get even closer together. Now, let us imagine a hypothetical situation where the speed has become so fast that it's become infinite. At infinite speed, there will be no more oscillation, and the points of rest will, in fact, overlap, and you would get a straight line. Now, what kind of state would that be? First of all, we see that it's a paradox because the infinite speed now has become total rest. We could probably call it the state of the absolute. It's the source out of which all the frequencies arise.
And it will also have the maximum energy. All energy is in it, but it's all in a potential state. And when it begins, begins to vibrate, then it creates all these different frequencies, which begin to interact, as we saw before, creating uh, our reality. So one could summarize this by saying, the absolute is the point where extremes merge, and a state of rest implies infinite speed. In fact, they become one and the same. And this state, the absolute state, is the substrate for all reality which emerges out of it. In particle physics, there is a principle of uncertainty which was formulated by Heisenberg, and it says, when the momentum or the speed of a particle is known, its position becomes unknowable. The more we know about one, the less we know about the other. Apply to the pendulum, what does it give us? When the pendulum stops before it reverses direction, we do know its speed because it's zero. And then it stops again and we know its speed again. So that means that at those points, its location becomes unknowable. And as Ben said, it can be found anywhere in the universe that is, it becomes the universe, it fills all creation, it is everywhere. And based on this, he developed much of his um, further thinking. If this is our solid reality, and like a pendulum, we oscillate and we take off every now and then and we touch that absolute state of total rest. But it happens so fast that we're not even aware of it. And we come back as if nothing had happened. But suppose we can expand that state and experience it, and in fact we can, then this is what will happen. Here is our reality, and here is the other reality, which we now have expanded. And we can uh, be conscious on that level sim simultaneously with this level so that we can actually have the benefit of both and we can explore that reality and bring back the information and this is in fact what Ben did and the information that I will be talking about from now on will, was received in those states of expanded consciousness. Usually in those states of expanded consciousness, there is a different perception of time. People who come out of those states usually say, time has stopped, or at least it's slowed down. What is happening here? And to put it in some kind of perspective, Ben designed this diagram. This is our time space, and this is the now moment where they cross, which is going from the past into the future the eternal now moment. And we can project one second on it, two seconds on it, and so forth. It's very reliable, and we can measure it, and we can catch trains on time, and be uh, to work on time, and so forth. However, superimposed on that are two other vectors of space-time, which are our subjective space-time. And usually they overlap, and we don't even know the difference. But in altered states of consciousness, there is a deviation. And by altered states, uh, we can uh, mean sleep or meditation or um, those deep altered states. And the angle of deviation actually determines the depth of that state. And look what happens. If we project one second, we see that now in this position of the subjective time, we have two seconds for one objective second, which means that our time has already doubled. Now visualize the situation where the subjective time tilts more and more and more, where it practically becomes parallel with objective space, and this is what it would look like. Our subjective time is now overlapping objective space. What kind of situation would that be? Well, it would take no time to go anywhere because you are everywhere at once. 
because your subjective time has overlapped objective space and it's become infinite. This would be the state of samadhi, the ultimate expansion of consciousness in which you in, you, your consciousness fills the entire universe. Well, in those states, where does one go? There are many places to go. And again, to put it into some kind of perspective, Ben designed this diagram of the levels of consciousness in creation. Because every level, as we saw before, reflects a state of evolution of matter on that level. And there is an indigenous population on all these levels that relates to that level. And our human band is only over here. So he looked at consciousness in its totality. If this vector here represents the quality of consciousness, this one represents the quantity of, of consciousness or the capacity of a nervous system to react to stimuli. So here we put the atom, the virus, the plant, and an animal, and finally a human being. So this is where we are in the range of things, and there are many other levels above. And of course, it's all going towards the ultimate state of the absolute that we talked about before. And they're all contained within it. Consciousness is modular. A larger consciousness contains a lesser consciousness. We also see here these curves. And these are called energy exchange curves. And they peak in the middle of each band, which means that the interaction with the environment here is the highest. And I find myself and you find yourselves in this physical reality because our energy exchange curve is highest in this level. However, we can also interact with the neighboring realities. But as you can see, the, the uh, uh, curve here tapers off so that we are not interacting as clearly and as well in those other realities. But still we do. And our nervous system is capable of spanning all these levels, except that we seem to be tuned only to this physical reality. And like a radio set, we can receive all the others, but we keep listening to this one. But it's up to us to tune into all the others as well. Now, the reality below us is the animal, plant, mineral. Those are the realities that um, Castaneda talks about, for example, in his books, the interaction with those realms. And the upper part uh, is interacting with the next level to the human band, which is the so-called emotional level or astral. There are different names for these levels, and it doesn't really matter as long as we know what, what it means. And the next level is the mental, then the intuitive or causal, and so forth. There are certain characteristics about this, these levels, and we, we interact with all of them, and we can function in all of them. Uh, the, the one next to us is the emotional level. And uh, this is where we go in sleep. As Ben said, this is a preview of coming attractions, because when we die, this is where we go, and we all interact on this level. The next level is the mental level, and uh, emotions, in fact, are not allowed there. So that before you can cross the boundary, uh, it's almost as if there is a customs official who says, any emotions to declare. And down you go if you can't uh, release emotions that are negative, actually, the emotions such as fear or anger. However, love, which sometimes is perceived as an emotion, is what Ben called is the glue of the universe. And without it, in fact, you can't even go higher. So uh, when you abandon those emotions, you can enter the mental level. And here your reality is what you think. It is also so on our level, but to a lesser degree. But here you're actually creating your reality by what, by what you think. The next level is the intuitive level. And this is where. Uh, we all interact, and um, people of creative professions, particularly, uh, visit those areas. And on that level, they pick up a lot of information, and they bring it down. The creative aha moment of discovery, for example, of an inventor or an artist. 
when suddenly a solution comes or an image comes is in fact something that one perceived on this intuitive level. And as you saw before, our time expands on higher levels. So there was an enormous amount of time here to study the entire situation and then to bring it down. But when you bring it down, it appears like a flash, the aha moment, whereas in fact you spent a lot of time there uh, getting ready for it. Our next subject will be a very important principle, the hologram, which is uh, the basis of reality as Ben perceived it. And as usual, Ben had some interesting diagrams to explain his ideas, and he explained the hologram in terms of um, three pebbles being dropped into a pizza pan filled with water. And you drop these pebbles simultaneously into the water. What happens? Each pebble announces what happens to it. In fact, it, it's screaming, help, I'm drowning in a pizza pan. So it sends out these wavelets that reach every point on the surface of this water. And every pebble does that. So. Uh, if we take this water now, which, uh, re which resulted in a uh, pattern of wavelets that now clash into one another, all this information about the pebbles, and it's called the interference pattern in cross-section, it would look like that. And if you quick freeze the water and you get a piece of ice like this, which is actually a photograph of all the information about these pebbles. And then you take what is known as coherent light, or light where all the rays are of the same frequency, uh, a laser light, and you shine it through this interference pattern. Lo and behold, you see the three pebbles reconstructed three-dimensionally in space. This is the important part of the hologram, that all the information is contained in this pattern, and every point of this pattern contains that information. Because if by mistake you break this piece of ice, and you end up with a little sliver of it, and you shine the same light through it, you will still get your three pebbles. So this method of storing information is the most efficient way that nature has devised. And uh, so Ben was a great believer and observer of the phenomenon of the um, uh, relationship between the micro level and the macro level. When nature comes up with a method that really works, then it will be repeated on all these different levels, and we see more of that later. This is an actual photograph, if you can see it, of waves interacting with each other, creating this moiré pattern of waves. It will actually look something like that. And here, if you shine this coherent light, the three-dimensional object gets reconstructed. Now, if instead of those three pebbles, we substitute three individuals, because we, like the pebbles, are constantly sending out information about ourselves in a variety of ways, and all these fields are interacting, creating a hologram, an interference pattern, and you could say that human consciousness is one big hologram of information about humanity as a whole. We are one mind, one consciousness. And of course, the implications of this are stupendous, because uh, if we realize there, that everything that we do, that we think, affects not only us, but everyone else, and not only everyone else, in humanity, but it also goes beyond the boundaries of our planet. And another way of looking at this would be to see these three pebbles or three separate individuals who feel themselves so isolated on this physical level. But if these uh, lines here indicate um, ever-widening consciousness, we notice that on these higher levels, we begin to interact. So these two are interacting here, these two here, but all three are interacting on the next level.
And if you visualize humanity being composed of these separate dots and billions of us, then on the highest level, we are all interacting and we are all one. And of course, you can look at it in reverse, that here is human consciousness, all one, and it sort of percolates down or dribbles down into these separate units, and we all think that we are so separate. And as we interact, we entrain each other. As we saw before, there is a principle of resonance and of entrainment or rhythm communication. In other words, a consciousness that has done its homework. This is a teacher, a guru, who has advanced somewhat beyond the others then his energy, his consciousness, will be more coherent, it will be more harmonious. And like those oscillators that we looked at, it will entrain and pull after itself consciousnesses that are less evolved. So now in this next section, we will be looking at the model of the universe that Ben came up with as a result of his personal experience. But before that, we will look at the uh, model of the universe according to the Big Bang theory as postulated by Gamow. In the infinite dark void, all energy all space-time were condensed at one point, the cosmic egg. And this cosmic egg, for a reason we'll never know, exploded. And it exploded evenly in all directions, and the energy went out in the form of light radiation, photons. Gradually, stable particles were formed, protons, neutrons, and gases began to form. Helium and hydrogen gas were formed. And the gases condensed into stars with heavier elements forming in their cores and the stars were condensing into galaxies, into clusters of spiral and other galaxies. And as the stars aged, they turned into red giants. And in dying, they would explode, scattering cosmic dust through the universe. And this cosmic dust containing heavier elements would condense again into clouds and new stars and planets. So that the same substance is recirculating and is really, there is nothing new only the forms change. And the atoms from distant galaxies are found in the atoms of our Earth and therefore in our own physical bodies. So this is the hologram to which we belong and of which we are a part, an inseparable part. And so, now I will look at Ben's model of the universe, which he developed having looked at this existing theory of the Big Bang, and which he modified somewhat because what he saw was a different kind of bang, a continuous, modest bang. In the 60s, new celestial bodies were discovered, and they were called quasars. These were radio galaxies of enormous size, the oldest galaxies, the oldest celestial bodies ever observed. And many of them showed a jet emerging from the center 
and shooting out. These galaxies are the most distant objects ever observed in the universe, and they're the fastest object moving. Here we see the jet emerging. And as I mentioned before, Ben was a great believer in the analogy of the micro level reflecting the macro level. And based on the evidence produced by the quasars, he came up with this model of the universe. What Ben was saying is that actually this is a prototype of what happened in the beginning of the universe and that the quasars are the chips off the old block and that that cosmic egg instead of expanding evenly in all directions or isotropically as it's called it actually was an explosion in one direction like a balloon pricked with a needle and what would happen if you had a jet emerge from this original cosmic egg there would there was nothing around it it was the only thing in that vast void so this jet would be pulled back in upon itself by this gravitational mass it would be analogous to holding up a water hose and the water would eventually fall down and then rise again and this would be the current that would be established so it would be a continuous bang, a modest but a continuous bang. Quasars were observed to be not evenly distributed in the observable universe. The observable universe is what we see through our telescopes. If this is our Earth, then this is the radius uh, of the um, distance where we can make our observations uh, through the existing telescopes. Quasars were observed moving faster and being further away in the North Galactic Pole. And in the South Galactic Pole, they were more concentrated and slightly off the true pole by about 30 degrees. So when Ben looked at that, he realized that there was inosotropy. In other words, there was an uneven distribution of quasars. Uh, this was an element that somehow contradicted or brought in a new element into the Big Bang theory. And this is what he developed uh, as his own. So this would be the structure then. This is the core of the structure, which is called torus, T-O-R-U-S, uh, a melon-like structure. And matter emerges from the center in the same sequence as we saw before, condensing from light radiation, from photons to stable particles, and so on. Then it expands, and visualize this as a three-dimensional form, goes around and gets pulled back in upon itself into the black hole. This is a white hole and the black hole back to back. This is the gravitational collapse as galaxies are pulled in to the black hole and, uh, and then uh, re-emerge as energy again on another round to go around and around again. And each time matter goes around, it gets refined. Its consciousness is on the next rung of the spiral. This is where Ben would place our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, because Quasars were found off the true galactic pole in the south. In other words, he said, we may be looking straight back into the jet here, whereas the other side showed uh, the quasars further away and moving faster. That means that they were entering this expansion where matter is rarefied and goes around. Now, if we equate matter with consciousness, and as I said before, there is nothing but consciousness, and matter is only a form in which consciousness appears. So in that case, the expansion that our galaxy is now entering, the expansion of matter, could also mean the expansion of consciousness. And this could explain, perhaps, why we are experiencing a certain change 
in consciousness on this planet. This would be the core of that Taurus structure. The white hole through which energy emerges, condenses, becomes matter, goes around, gets pulled back into the black hole. And between them is what might be called the singularity point. In physics, it's a situation where laws no longer apply. And here, a transmutation occurs of matter that has condensed to an extreme, and it becomes energy again to reemerge as a new universe. So one could say that there are several phases to this trip of matter around the torus. Phase one, from energy to matter, through expansion, the ultimate expansion is at this point, then there is con condensation and finally a gravitational collapse where the uh, uh, gravitational pull is such that even photons can't ex escape to tell the story. That's why it's a black hole. As you recall, we talked about the interference pattern of information, which is the hologram. Remember that every speck of matter on the surface of this torus is sending out information about itself. Our galaxy does, and so does a galaxy and many other galaxies which have gone ahead of us. So that the information that is being sent out gets interwoven into one web of information about the entire structure. This is the information that one can tap in those higher states of consciousness and in fact enter the knowledge that's available about the entire structure because we are a part of this hologram, that little sliver that still retains uh, some of that information and by tuning into the totality of the hologram we can have the information about every part of it and that's exactly what Ben did. Again, the analogy between the macro level and the micro level. This is very similar to the ordinary chicken egg in shape. So what Ben did was to take a chicken egg and attach electrodes to the two ends of it and see if there was any current there. And lo and behold, there was a certain potential there of 2.4 millivolts, very, uh, very small and yet there. So there is a field around every seed and every egg in nature that we know. In other words, there seems to be the same pattern in this egg as there is in this large torus. So nature tends to repeat a certain design. As an engineer, Ben dealt with structures, and he said there are certain elegant solutions to the problem. So hologram certainly is one for storing information, and uh, this structure seems to be another one that is repeated on different levels. So here is our white hole and black hole and matter circulating round and around. In the center, it's hollow, and it's an electromagnetic field. And we could say that this interference pattern of information could be called the universal mind hologram. And also, the concept of time enters here, because it takes time for matter to um, to go around and for energy in, form, in the form of photons, light energy, to become matter. So time becomes a factor of distance of energy as it issues from the white hole and goes around because time exists when there is motion and where there is mass. So that this is linear time from here to there, one round. This is the birth of time, and this is the death of time. But seen from outside, as we are looking at it now, from another dimension, we see that this is a continuum. And we are looking at it from, perhaps, an eternal point of view, so that this linear time is a very limited uh, phenomenon 
in the scheme of things. And it is the force of evolution again that keeps driving this along. And Ben used to say that uh, the torus is a distilling column of consciousness, that this structure actually is refining consciousness, which is equivalent to matter, as matter is recirculated through this black and white hole. There is a field like that around the human body, and the different frequencies interact, creating nodes. And uh, also, medicine is moving into a new field, new energy medicine or vibrational medicine. Uh, the body is seen as a field of interacting electromagnetic or electric fields. And a new medicine is really emerging. So now we will look at Ben's personal experience through those higher levels of creation. And these he described in his book, which he called a cosmic book on the mechanics of creation. As I said before, he saw things in terms of structure. So. On that journey into the expanded states of consciousness, it's like a guided tour. You can ask questions, and you get answers. And once you understand and you say, OK, I got it, the slide changes, the page is turned, and you're shown new things. So he asked, well, I've seen that model of the universe. In fact, he did perceive it in an expanded state. And then he started figuring out what it's all about. So having seen it, he said, well, it looks like a bounded structure. There must be something beyond it. I want to know. The moment the question is asked, his consciousness finds itself in this vastness of the infinite void. And the process is shown and explained to him. In the vastness of the dark void, a certain part becomes activated. This is where action will take place. And a light describes a certain territory. He called it proto-matter. This is a matrix, which will be eventually filled with matter, like the Chinese checkers, which get filled with those little marbles. And this field begins to polarize. As we saw before, the field, the ultimate field of the absolute, which the void is, is reconciling the opposites. So the opposites of the plus and minus are together. So they begin to separate. And it's like unscrambling scrambled eggs. And uh, the tension is enormous, because they don't really want to be separated, and they want to come back together again. But this is what creates the dynamics of manifest creation, because uh, you need the polarization in order for action to occur. So what happens next is this. As the two ends want to come together, there is finally a tremendous pull, and one side reaches the other, and a sound actually fills creation. This is the sound, the first word that creates different frequencies of vibration. And they begin to interact within, within this structure. And a certain current gets established and starts going around. Then there is a secondary sound. And a droplet is left in the middle. This becomes the focal point of this structure. And this is the white and black hole that we saw before. This is the consciousness whose body this is. The matter of this torus is like an oak tree in relation to the acorn. This center here, the black-white hole, is the consciousness that has the blueprint for this structure. And it's learning through the interaction of its parts, through all the particles that go around and around and get refined. And their consciousness is getting higher and higher each time around. 
this point grows in the process. It evolves. And what would you call a consciousness that is in charge of the universe? What is a consciousness whose body the universe is? And as Ben said, well, you would call it a creator. And he didn't know whether to call it a he or, an, or a she. He would say, you can't say it's a chairperson of the universe. But it is the creator of the universe who is evolving by experiencing his body in this way. Well, once you have seen this, you want to know more about it. Because again, this is a bounded structure. So there must be more. And we, with our finite mind, cannot grasp infinity or eternity, so we want to see what's next. And so the moment you ask again, the next picture is shown to you and explained. And what you see are more such luminous toroidal shapes appearing in the void. And as you approach, you see that they are arranged in a spiral, seven universes per each rung of the spiral. This seems like a lot to take in at first, and you begin to count and you realize that there are seven rungs to the spiral, which means that there are 49 universes. And on top of that structure, there appears to be a very luminous something. And as you approach it closer, this brilliant white light seems to have a shape such as this. And Ben, being familiar with the Hebrew language, looked at that and he said, no, I must be programming myself. This looks like the Hebrew letter Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And immediately the explanation comes, no, this is not an, a Hebrew letter. This is an interference pattern of four energies interacting on this level, on this cosmic level, and they create this pattern, which is a consciousness whose body this is. This consciousness contains the consciousnesses of all the 49 creators. In other words, consciousness is modular. As, we've, as we saw before with the ducks, a more evolved consciousness, a larger consciousness will contain the lesser ones. As Ben was looking at all these things, he said, I'm just a tourist. I'm snapping pictures and bringing them back. I don't know what I'm looking at. And uh, I'm just one of, of you all. We're all on this cosmic journey on a bus, except some of us have window seats and, ha and some have aisle seats. I happen to have a window seat so I can share with you what I'm observing. So he had no explanations for these except that he was seeing something and then asking questions. So as he approached this olive a little closer, what he saw was that the front of it was a brilliant white light, and the back was dark, and it looked rather three-dimensional. It's a hologram. And there are 22 uh, such forms, interference patterns, emerging from the luminous side. And they look exactly like the Hebrew letters. And he was explained again that these are interference patterns that were observed by seers in antiquity. And they incorporated them into the Hebrew letters, into the Hebrew alphabet. But they, they are there objectively to be observed. On the other side, the same forms emerge but in a random, mixed-up order. And he was explained that these interference patterns are transducers of the Aleph energy down to the physical level. They step it down further and further to the physical level. And this whole uh, diagram actually illustrates the law of the cosmic level, because what it's really saying that evil is simply ignorance of the law. The proper sequence of these characters is knowledge of the law. But a mixed up order is ignorance of the law, which then becomes evil. 
And what is the law? And when you ask the question, you are shown. Close up, this is the structure. The olive breaks itself down into three centers, three chakras, each one having these interference patterns in them which look like Hebrew letters, and each Hebrew letter has an equivalent numerical value so that everything is actually modular and uh, uh, structured. Each center has its own frequency in terms of color. The center, which is love, ya, is gold. The center representing the will, call, is blue, and the center representing the cre creation is pink. When Ben looked at that, he realized that the white light of the Aleph representing wisdom is a combination of all these colors. And these are actually frequencies active on that level which create these holograms. Now the law that we talked about before, the cosmic law operative on this level, is interpreted in a very ingenious way. These characters, which then uh, became the Hebrew language, can be read in, in different directions and mean opposite things. If you read from left to right, it reads Heilech, which means go, or it's a green light. In other words, you can act safely if you act from love towards will. But if you act from will, to love, self-will, before you know love, then it reads klaya, and in Hebrew it means destruction or extinction. So that is the cosmic law. The cosmic law is love, and the ignorance of the cosmic law then causes destruction. And the creative center, read in opposite directions, means in the beginning, there was the desire for life. Having seen this, you want to see the entire structure. And this is what you see. The Aleph and his 49 creators is enclosed in a sphere very similar to a biological cell. And in fact, it's like a DNA coil, and it does split at the end when this unit is mature. So, having seen this and the current constantly circulating around this, you want to break out and you want to see what's beyond that. But you keep bumping into this wall and you can't get out. When finally you do break through, this is what you see. You are surrounded by more cosmoses. And they're pressing against each other like frogs' eggs. And you're caught in this structure, it looks like a biological structure. So, again, you want to know where it's all leading you, and you go through this structure, and this is what you find. There is a term in biology, closed-packed structure. In other words, if you take a cell, you can only put six of the same size around it. And on top of that, you can only fit three so that they would be stable. And on top of that, only one. So that from the side view, it will appear like this. It will be one on top of three on top of seven. And it will look like a pyramid with a triangular side on all sides, which is called tetrahedron. Now, what's interesting about that is that in physics, there is something known as fine structure constant, and it is 1, 3, 7. It is a method which demonstrates um, how atoms differ from each other. It determines the size of an atom because it determines the tension and the interaction between the electron and the nucleus. So it's interesting to note that the first stable structure on the cosmic level is a tetrahedron. And we, on our physical plane here on Earth, have the diamond, which is the strongest substance we know, and it has a tetrahedral molecular structure. So there is perhaps a resonance here with the cosmic level, and that's why 
the diamond is the strongest substance we know. And then these units of tetrahedrons uh, form modules of two such tetrahedrons joined together, and this is how that field of cosmoses, the frog's eggs, is formed. Once you break out of that soup of cosmoses, you discover that they are contained in turn in a yet larger sphere, so that one structure is within another. And uh, as you examine it closer, you see that in the center of this, perhaps you should call it supercosmos, there is a hollow. And inside that, uh, cosmos shells are being formed. And they emerge from that and evolve towards the surface, whereas the Aleph's, uh, the Aleph's spiral um, has all those, those universes on the spiral evolving up towards the Aleph. So here, the cosmoses, in turn, evolve towards the surface of the supercosmos. And the mature cosmoses then emerge on the outside. They begin to cluster together and form a new supercosmos, and they kind of elbow their way in, pushing the other ones aside. And you see that this is a growing, almost biological structure. Now, on every level of these structures that you perceive, there is a consciousness in charge. The Aleph was in charge of the cosmos. And here, on the level of the supercosmos, this form appears. And in order for you to know that it's a consciousness that you can interact with, a face or a likeness of a face will appear in it and say, I can talk to you. And in order to understand what it's saying, you merge with it, and then you begin to understand a little more about that level. And here I would like to digress a little bit to talk about consciousness, because there appear to be two types of consciousness. One that is the consciousness of the structure itself, and the other that uses that structure as a temporary dwelling. If we look at our own bodies, and for example, we talk to the cell of our kidney, and we ask the kidney cell, what is it that you do? What is your job here? The kidney cell will say, I don't really know. I'm just a little fellow here. Why don't you ask the boss? Now, who is the boss? It's the sum total of all the cells of the kidney. And it already is a consciousness that you can interact with. And the kidney will tell you, well, I purify blood. I do this and I do that. And so every organ in our body is a sum total of the consciousnesses of the cells that compose it. And then there, there appears to be a consciousness, which is the sum total of all the consciousnesses of all the organs. And you could say that it's perhaps a rudimentary consciousness, if you can call it that, of the body. It runs the body when it is unconscious. In other words, the other consciousness is away. When you sleep, when you are under anesthesia, there's somebody running your body. Somebody is breathing. Uh, the lungs know what they're doing. The heart continues to pump blood. It is conscious, and it's unrelated to the consciousness that is temporarily away. So the same thing happens on every level. There is a consciousness of the structure itself and another one that uses that structure and can come and go. So we can also say the same thing about our Earth, for example. It's a conscious being. And there is a consciousness that runs the planet. It's um, electromagnetic field, it's temperature, it's currents, and other things, the ecology of the planet. And then there must be another consciousness which uses it as a garage, as Ben used to put it. And it can come and go. It's a much larger consciousness. And so uh, it's true of the sun and of every other level as you go up. So Ben perceived these consciousnesses as abstract forms that would appear on different levels. And they would communicate with you. And uh, you can learn from them. We saw this on the supercosmic level. Then comes the Ankh, the cross, the two triangles, the two 
crossing and then something that looks a little bit like the Egyptian pharaoh, the first human form that runs the seventh level. There were seven levels in all, and each level ever simpler, ever larger, and comprising the levels that were below it. As I said, consciousness is modular. So, as you go through all these levels, finally, you come to a level where all these levels are contained in one sphere, the manifest creation. Everything visible and invisible, everything that ever existed is in it. And around it is this infinite dark void, which is the consciousness itself. And as it vibrates, as we saw before, it creates manifest creation. So as you come closer to this, you begin to discern what appear to be rotating disks covering its surface. And as you look closer, this is what you see. Instead of disks, you see that these are bars having little shapes underneath like that. And these bars spin around. These shapes spin around. And there are three layers of these. And the fourth, the outermost layer, looks like this. And you begin to recognize these as, as shapes known as the Sanskrit letters, and then this one as the symbol which stands for Om, or cosmic consciousness in Sanskrit. So again, you're explained when you ask about it, these are not Sanskrit letters. These are holograms, interference patterns that are active on that level, and they were perceived by the seers and incorporated into the Sanskrit alphabet. So, as you look at this manifest creation, you realize that there must be a consciousness that runs this, the ultimate consciousness. And you want to understand how this structure is run and what's happening with these rotating disks. And you are explained that as this cell or as this being grows, and we saw that it's constantly expanding and developing and evolving, it expands into the surrounding void, which is pure consciousness as we remember. So that as it expands into it, the void begins to penetrate it. And these rotating disks are acting as modulators of the void. And by rotating, they create a sound, the word of creation, which then begins to interact within itself. It's a hologram of sound or a hologram of different frequencies that begin to create all kinds of harmonics and, and um, uh, all kinds of additional sounds that develop out of, out of these interactions of different frequencies. And so the whole thing is forever evolving. So. Then you ask, so who is the top god? Who runs this structure? And the moment you ask, you find yourself in the infinite void, and suddenly a brilliant light comes down on you, so brilliant that you're blinded, and you're shaking, because now you realize you are talking to the ultimate god of the structure. So what do you do? You peek under and you realize that this is a tunnel of light. So you enter that and you begin to ascend and you go faster and faster. And in fact, you begin to tumble down faster and faster. And then you realize that it's making a U-turn. And at the end, there is something there. And you know that that is it. And you will soon be confronting the God of manifest creation. As you finally look at it, you realize that you are looking at yourself, a carbon copy of yourself. But that self sits there paying no attention to you 
and you're lost. You don't know what to say to yourself. How is the weather up there? What do you say to yourself? So, you revert to your old tested trick. You merge with yourself so that by merging, you can know yourself and you can find out what it's all about. So, you turn around and you slowly back into yourself like into a tight garage. And when you finally do, what happens is that there is a tremendous bang and you become the void. Because you are the consciousness, which is the void. And that part of you that had never left has always been the void. And that observer that was watching through your eyes and guiding you through this obstacle course to go back to yourself, your higher self, was the observer that had never left and was watching you creating this whole phantasmagoria for yourself. We each create our own. And it's just a trip back home to reunite with your own self. And so we could say that we are the creators, the producers, and the consumers of our own reality because we are the consciousness itself. And Ben liked to finish his talks by quoting a poem by an Indian sage, Shankara, which went like this. On the vast canvas of the self, the picture of manifold worlds is painted by the self itself. And that supreme self, seeing but itself, enjoys great delight.